Hello, everyone, and welcome to the UCLA School of Nursing's Virtual Dean's Town Hall. I have three brief housekeeping notes for all of you before I turn it over to Dean Sarna. Number one, please be aware that the Zoom event will be recorded. Our intent is to upload this to our YouTube channel after the fact so that others may rewatch later. Number two, if you have any questions for our speakers, please submit them via the Q&A box at the bottom. At the end of the Zoom event, a brief survey will be sent out for all of you to complete. It'll only take about 30 seconds. We ask that you all complete it. It'll help us really enhance our future Zoom programs. And those are all of the housekeeping notes I have. Without further ado, I'd like to now welcome the Dean of the UCLA School of Nursing, Dr. Linda Sarna. Hello, everyone. Thank you for spending your evening with us. My purpose today is to share with you, our loyal alumni and friends, how we're doing at the School of Nursing in 2020, post-pandemic. As you know, we began this year, 2020 is the year of the nurse. We certainly have celebrated the hero heroism of our nurses on the front line, but I'd like to shine a light on some of the resilience of the nurse educators who are preparing the next generation of nurses to address pandemics and also the realities of health inequities and racial disparities. I am so delighted that this evening I'm sharing the virtual dais with the Chief Nursing Executive of UCLA Health, Karen Grimley. She's also the Assistant Dean at the School of, the Nur uh, School of Nursing and she's demonstrated great courage in the clinical arena, arena, and she's also been a terrific champion for the School of Nursing in allowing our nurses to have a clinical experience. I have a few slides for you today to provide a little highlight about uh, what's happening with the school. And I wanted to begin with uh, actually our fabulous virtual graduation. So last June, we celebrated for the first time a virtual graduation where we had over 200 graduates and almost 1,000 family members and friends. Alicia Georges was our dynamic keynote speaker. But now fall quarter is going to be quite different from the past. We're going to be continuing our remote instruction that we began in March with our stay at home order for LA County. We've been allowed as the School of Nursing to continue to have in-person skills training and our students still are in the clinical setting. We also are involved now in research ramp up. There was a time that we had to do research ramp down and close all of our research projects, especially those involving people. Another new thing that's gonna happen for the fall is that our faculty and students are gonna have COVID testing at the baseline. I will tell you that our, as part of our research ramp up that our, um, doctoral students and our faculty members are starting to come back into that clinical arena. We will hear next from LA County about their advice for higher education after the Thanksgiving holiday. But first I'd like to tell you a little bit about our amazing students. If I could have the next slide. The good news is that people still want to be nurses. We have over 630 students in our program, doctoral students, DNP students, APRN, MECN and BS programs. And our new students, if you could click through, are also a great group. And here you see some of the statistics. And if you could click on again, our new students come from various uh, walks of lives. We have athletes, actors, singers. We're not gonna have any problem having the national anthem uh, at graduation. We are also completing interviews for nurses applying for the National Clinician Postdoctoral Program at UCLA. 
and we held a virtual program this summer with the schools of medicine and dentistry for pre-health students. We're doing our very best to support our students during these challenging times. We've done this through our COVID emergency support fund. And we also were able through our professional supplemental degree tuition to provide all of our graduate master's students a $600 stipend this year to help, especially with remote learning. Over the summer to maintain our doctoral students, our PhD students and their research, they were able to get a $6,000 stipend so that they didn't have to have outside work. I also want to announce that we have a wonderful partnership with the Greater Los Angeles VA that's resulted in a post-residency program. 30 students applied, only six are gonna be selected. They're gonna have a mentorship year and at the end, they will have jobs. If I could have the next slide, please. I want to do a shout out to some of the leadership in the School of Nursing. And I know that some of these faces are familiar uh, to you. As you may know, uh, search for my successor is underway. I will be retiring uh, in June, but searches are going forward for a new Associate Dean for Diversity, Equity and Inclusion and two new Assistant Professor positions in Acute Care and Psych uh, Mental Health. I want to give a special shout out to our leadership team who have hung with me over the years, but also during the past six months. Uh, Eunice Lee, our faculty chair, is doing a fabulous job in helping us um, with our new strategic plan, which you're going to hear a little bit about in a few moments. Also in her very first year of um, at UCLA, sorry about that, Holly. Uh, Associate Dean for Research, Holly Devon, has done an admirable dean in supporting our researchers, both with the ramp up and ramp down. We are now number 19 in NIH funding, up from number 20 last year, and number 12 among uh, public schools of nursing. And again, this is out of 800 schools of nursing, just so you know. Uh, you can calculate the percentages. I also want to acknowledge uh, Deborah Cognac Griffin and Anita Braylock for leading our diversity council and for holding, caring, and sharing virtual opportunities to address the heartbreak of the racial injustice uh, that we've experienced, especially this summer, and to guide us to do better in our educational programs. Lynn Doreen, our Associate Dean for Academic Affairs, has led our um, academic efforts along with the program directors, Mary Cadigan for Advanced Practice, helped by John Lazar, and Anita Braylock, assisted by Emma Cuenca. Additionally, Lynn is leading our efforts to get ready for accreditation this fall. Wendy Robbins in her role as director of doctoral programs and Nancy Jo Bush as the director for our DNP program have had to support students who've had to address disruption in their research and scholarly projects during COVID. And a special shout out to Sheila Davis. Sheila is our assistant dean for administration and she's done an amazing job for supporting our staff who've been working remotely for the past six months. Uh, despite her own personal heartbreak, she has been my go-to person on so many issues, and she has now been appointed on a special campus-wide task force called Busting Bureaucracy. Her favorite saying is, teamwork makes dreams work. And that is so true. Two of our extraordinary staff, Willie Dawson and Michelle Aranda, have received a Golden Bruin Award, and they're going to be recognized at our virtual uh, faculty meeting uh, next week. And our next slide, please. And despite the pandemic, our amazing faculty continue to make us proud. These are just a few of our faculty who have distinguished themselves with awards, 
with publications despite the pandemic. And a special shout out to Dr. Nalo Hamilton, who's now a pro promoted to associate professor. We're so excited. And we're collaborating with others on a hiring initiative put out by the chancellor to foster the recruitment of faculty who address the uh, black experience. A critical part of this initiative is collaboration across campus. We're also recruiting for a 50% position for someone in psych mental health to help with our multi-campus initiative for psych mental health nurse practitioner certificate programs. A special thank you to our alum, Linda Gorman, for her generous financial support for this program. This program will launch in January 2021. Our next slide, please. And here are some familiar faces. We just inducted a new alumni board of directors. Thank you for taking this on during this challenging time. We had our first virtual meeting uh, in August. Uh, our alumni board of directors is being led by Tonya Amos Jones. And you can see a lot of the other wonderful people who've supported the school over the years. I'm so excited. At the end of this month, we're going to be holding our first virtual community advisory board. This is a group of nurse, nursing and health leaders who will help guide our curriculum and our scholarship to make sure that we are addressing community needs. And our next slide. Yes, despite the pandemic, life goes on, including CCNE accreditation, which as you know, happens about every um, eight years. And it's scheduled this year for October 14th to, through 16th. This will be a virtual site visit. So we prepared today, actually, a brief video to welcome reviewers to our campus. And we also uploaded our 100 page plus self-study and are readying a virtual resource room. No more compendiums of multiple binders. It's now all virtual. This has been led by Lynn, assisted by Suzette Carden and Carol, Carol Pavlish. They've been so critical, along with the staff support uh, directed by Sheila Davis. Next slide. Over the past couple of years, we've been engaged in strategic planning. And of course, it was disrupted a little bit during the pandemic, but we're almost there. We have identified five pillars of excellence in academics, research, diversity, equity, and inclusion, community engagement, and sustainability. The faculty have worked hard to set up goals for the next um, four years, along with strategies and tactics. And you, the community, also are going to have an opportunity to weigh in on our draft uh, while we tweak the final product, which is due to the Executive Vice Chancellor, uh, November 15. A key part of our strategic plan, as many of you know, is to have a conversion of our current APRN program Program to become a master's to DNP program. Next slide, please. Well, I've mentioned some of the things that have been happening at the school in, in fall to address COVID-19 and to address racial disparities. Now, I'm so pleased that Karen is going to share with you the multiple activities that are happening in the clinical space at the health center to address these challenges and some of the behind the scenes things that you just don't know about. So Karen, take it away. Uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity today, uh, Linda, to speak to the, uh, the group of people here at this town hall. It's a wonderful opportunity for us to showcase the marvelous relationship uh, that we have built uh, bridging from one side of Westwood Plaza to the to the next. 
uh, together, um, Linda and I have worked very hard to make sure that the the student's experience is one that allows them to take full advantage of both the academic and the clinical uh, aspects of their role as they grow. And we like to think that we provide the best of academia and practice uh, within their clinical assignments and their, their teaching opportunities. UCLA, uh, as we've worked through this partnership, uh, Linda and I have strived to make sure that those students are getting all the opportunities possible uh, to expand their clinical opportunities as well as um, get into different places that they haven't been here at UCLA before. Um, some of our efforts uh, have centered around getting nurse practitioners those uh, critical clinical uh, opportunities out in the uh, ambulatory world, uh, getting dedicated education units set up at Santa Monica so that we can would, could take advantage of um, the clinical expertise at the bedside in partnership with the instructor from the school to really round out a, the student's experience uh, in holistic care of our patients and uh, focus on some of the things that go on, as Linda mentioned a few minutes ago, behind the scenes because learning practice is more than learning the clinical aspects of care. It's learning the dynamics of a unit. It's learning how to interact with the interprofessional team to make a difference in everything we do. Uh, so that when you do graduate from school, you are armed and ready to face the challenges ahead. Um, all those efforts uh, got called to a very dramatic halt early this spring. It was March 4th. Uh, when the command center at UCLA opened um, at full throttle. During that time, uh, just to give you some idea of the level of things we had to accomplish in that sh short period of time, um, we had to change our entire mindset. We are a public hospital. Uh, we pride ourselves on be the tertiary and quaternary care that we provide to our community. And our community, because of what we provide, extends well beyond uh, Los Angeles and Los Angeles County uh, with some of the uh, transplant services and oncology and things like that. We reach out to people around the world. All this came to a very abrupt halt. This is in direct contradiction to who we are as an organization. And uh, we cling to our vision statement at UCLA. And I think it's part of what's made our relationship with the School of Nursing as strong as it is. And the, the health systems uh, vision is very simple to read, but very complex to carry out. It's healing humankind one patient at a time by improving health, alleviating suffering, and delivering acts of kindness. That said, how, our challenge was how do we continue to do that? How do we continue to support our educational mission? And how do we make sure that we are prepared for what we thought would be an onslaught of COVID patients? Um, the school, uh, all of the schools in health sciences and the School of Nursing all did things to help enhance our ability to care for our, our patients and to prep for what was to come. Some of the things that we were able to stand up in that short period of time behind the scenes, we put together over 200 um, different statements, whether they were policies, guidelines, or practices that we had to change or modify to accommodate the impending COVID population. We had to set up logistics around how to get the right amount of equipment to the right place at the right time. We had to set up new approaches to visiting guidelines. This was in direct opposition to who we are as an organization. Um, we had to shut out not only the students, we had to shut out visitors as well. And we, like the School of Nursing, are centered on patient and family-centered care. And relationships are at the center of that. And we had to all but terminate some of those relationships quite unexpectedly, um, almost through no fault of our own. Our decision to stop providing services was driven predominantly by the California Department of Public Health and state mandates. And while they were well-timed and well-intended, uh, it did cause us to have to kind of veer away from who we are and our mission to, to prepare uh, for the, the pandemic. We've been able to set up testing. We've been able to set up probably the most tests per day 
uh, of any community in short order. We've gone from having no testing sites March 4th to creating uh, a network that can perform over 1,400 tests a day now. Um, some of the things that drove a lot of the staff um, were, was the inability to partner with people, especially families, to help patients engage in care and get well. And so some of the things that we did was we looked at the technology that we had in our hands and we took things like tablets that we had at the bedside for patients to do their email and for patients to do their education and discharge planning. And we partnered with IT and found a way to create a one-touch Zoom, so to speak, for patients and families to communicate face-to-face, real-time, anytime they wanted. We were able to take that technology and morph it into something more than that by nurses taking that technology to the bedside and um, helping patients through procedures by having a family member FaceTiming with the patient uh, or being the first face the patient saw, even if it was virtual, uh, when they came up from uh, sedation. So um, the things that we were able to do and the things that we were able to impact allowed us to, to maintain our resilience and, and maintain our hope in moving forward uh, with healthcare and with education and research. All the while we were doing all this COVID preparation, the most interesting thing is the research did continue. It just changed its focus. We went from research uh, centered on different populations and topics to centering on the population of COVID and how we were coping, how we were helping patients cope, and how we were helping uh, make a difference in the care and management of COVID patients. And uh, even so much as how are we helping COVID patients um, with their last wishes as they, they prepared is their families prepared to help them pass. So a wide variety of things that we were able to do. And one of the things that stuck really hard in our, in our mission was how do we get the students back? How do we help the nursing students? Those poor nursing students, the, especially the um, pre-licensure students, how did we help them finish school? How did we help them get through the last month and a half or two months of stuff they had to do with their clinical rotations so that they could graduate on time. And I have to say that I think the partnership that UCLA Health and uh, the School of Nursing had prior to COVID really strengthened and made that possible. And I'm very proud to say that uh, with all the gumption we had, we got those kids through school and they were able to graduate. We also got that first DMP cohort through as well, um, partnering to zoom in to help with research, partnering to find different ways to help people with their um, getting their documents put together and submitted on time, all sorts of uh, things that we never in a million years would have thought we had to endure. Um, we've done a lot of things, I think, to really pr promote patient well-being and staff well-being here. Many of the staff that care for patients here at UCLA Health are actually students either who did their pre-licensure pre at UCLA or have matriculated um, credits and graduated from master's courses and uh, doctoral and become doctorally prepared as well. So finding ways to help everybody uh, be resilient take good care and manage, um, manage themselves and their work-life balance has been a, a key priority for all of us. Um, we've been very fortunate to partner with the School of Nursing on several different projects prior to COVID. And we used a lot of the learnings from those projects to help lay out wellness programs for staff. Um, some of the things that we've done around mindfulness and creating an app for people around meditation. Uh, we took those learnings and we walked through the buildings at both the Santa Monica campus and the Westwood campus and we identified space that we could uh, let the staff have, the nursing staff and other members of the team have to create respite or meditation rooms so that they would have time away from the hectic nature of caring for COVID and, and um, 
getting comfortable with, with the new environment as it changed every day. And I'm proud to say we still have those respite rooms in place. Um, I'm also very proud to say we've gotten the students back to school. And I'm also very proud to say that we've also helped families by us creating a mechanism to get people back to visit. And um, we were a little ahead of the curve and brought people back a little bit sooner to visit their loved ones uh, with limitations, of course. But I'd like to think that our ability to do that was because of our strong understanding of what a pandemic is, of what COVID has done, and the harsh reality of understanding we need to ad adopt COVID as something that's gonna be here for a very long time. And that we need to now begin our new normal and get ourselves as close to our mission, vision, and values as we were prior to the pandemic by healing humankind one patient at a time. And I'm happy to say that as fast as we ramped down our services, uh, at the middle of May, we put a plan in place to ramp back up. And I'm very proud to say that we are at over 100% capacity at the Ronald Reagan campus at this point in time, and probably hovering close to about 80% plus at the Santa Monica campus. That could only have been done by the strength uh, and the wisdom that we've gotten from our partnership with our academic partners and our commitment to research, education, and discovery, as well as our commitment to high quality care that we deliver every day. So um, that's a long-winded way of saying the academic clinical partnership that we've established between the School of Nursing and the nursing departments at UCLA have truly made a difference in allowing us to be the state-of-the-art place to be for the best quality care and for the best opportunity, opportunities for great health for not only our patients, but the staff who take care of them. So that said, Linda, I'd like to turn it back over to you. All right, thank you, Dr. Grimley, and thank you, Dr. Sarna. At this point, I'd like to go ahead and move on to the Q&A portion of our event. So we have some questions for both of you. Uh, let me just pull that up. We have some questions for both of you, so feel free um, to both of you respond. But first, this one's directed towards Dr. Grimley. Dr. Sorna, if you'd like to respond in any way, feel free to do so. Uh, from the audience, can you please speak to the future of new graduate nurse residency programs and job prospects for graduating nurses? I think there's gonna be a lot of opportunities for new nurses. Um, I. I think the one thing that we will realize from the pandemic is there are going to be a lot of people once we're through this, because that's who nurses are, we will get through this before they make life decisions around retirement. Uh, but I, I think that we will see a fair number of people retire from the profession in the next year or so. So that really makes a lot of room for our new graduates. Uh, and we at UCLA, we pride ourselves on running two new grad classes each year with a bona fide in, uh, residency program that runs approximately a year. So we have kept that going. Um, we did not hire a fall class, but we did bring our spring class through this year, um, even you know despite the pandemic. So we have probably about 40 or 50 new grads who are finished, who have just finished up their residency program, and we will be actively recruiting for a spring term. But I think you'll find lots of opportunity for new grads. And to any of you with students in nursing programs or to any of you who are students in nursing programs, please look for hospitals that do have residency programs. It makes all the difference in helping people assimilate to not only practice, but to the social dynamic and the, the cultural nuances that you'll find in an organization. And I'll just add, I, I want to thank Karen for the, the long history of UCLA Health with these residency programs. I'm very excited about the new Greater Los Angeles VA post-residency program. Cedars-Sinai also has a residency program. Our clinical partners really have been there for the next generation. There, you know, there was a time when people only, want to only wanted to hire experienced nurses. Fortunately, now they recognize the importance of 
bringing in new, well-educated nurses and creating uh, the best possible clinician in their own practices. So I'm very encouraged for the future. But I will say, as Karen knows, that nursing is going to change. And one of the ways that we know that it's changed is with telehealth. And our Vice Chancellor, John Maziata, talked about in January where we had 800 telehealth visits. And in May, we had 85,000 telehealth visits. So needless to say, that's going to be part of our nursing education. And that is how to engage with patients over the screen time. Mm -hmm. Agreed. And I think the other thing we've realized too, uh, Linda, is the tremendous growth in the need for behavioral health care. And one of the programs that uh, Linda is working on very hard right now across the, the UC system is a, a wonderful program for a psych certification for nurse practitioners. And I, I really think you should mention that, Linda. That's huge. It, it is huge because it could be a model for other certificate programs. This is a collaboration from UCSF School of Nursing, the Betty Irene Moore School of Nursing, UC Davis, and UCLA for nurses throughout the state. We've got a lofty goal of educating 300 nurse practitioners to get their certification in psych mental health. And Karen has been extremely important to try to negotiate placements at SEML. And I think what we may be doing, Karen, really with billing is creating something that's never been done throughout UC for NP students who are in certificate programs. So again, it's another way that we're going to be leading. But there are other areas uh, in mental health. I think pediatrics is one. And I neglected to say that one of the ways that we've been uh, supporting our, the mental health of our faculty, students, and staff is through uh, Barbara Dim and, and her mindfulness uh, virtual interventions. And it, it's been... Uh, so appreciated. Yeah. Wonderful. All right. Thank you both. This next question is directed towards uh, Dr. Sarna. But again, Dr. Grimley, if you have anything um, you'd like to add, feel free to hop on in. Uh, so Dr. Sarna, can you please address how you see clinicals and clinical partnerships being impacted by COVID-19 and how the UCLA School of Nursing will provide for clinical sites for both undergraduate and graduate nursing students during the pandemic? Thank you. And that's an excellent question because all of nursing education, frankly, around the world, I'm going to imagine, but, but particularly in the United States, was impacted by COVID. There were schools of nursing across the country that just shut down. They yeah. just stopped totally. We persevered. Uh, the Board of Registered Nursing, with a lot of nudging and support from data, did allow us some virtual hours. Those uh, ended September 1, but that made a big difference in graduating this cohort. There is a bill right now on the governor's desk that I hope is going to be signed off that will have an emergency contingent to allow for uh, decisions in a situation like the pandemic where that we can use virtual simulation in place of in-person uh, learning. We were very fortunate with uh, Karen's commitment at UCLA Health that welcomed back our students in spring. Also with the VA that continued to welcome our students back, Cedars and some of the other practices, but not all of them have, have been able to accept our students. And some of that was because of the initial limitations on PPE. We just didn't have adequate resources now we're better, and by the way, our nursing students are gonna look a little bit different in the clinical enterprise because now they're gonna have eye goggles or face shields in addition to their face coverings. So the practice of nursing also is going to um, uh, change. But this, um, this is something not unique to the school. Every uh, school of nursing at the University of California and uh, throughout the state is facing it. Thank you, Dr. Sarna. This next audience question is for Dr. Grimley. What new roles do you see that nurses can lead and or fill that are either a gap or are newly created because of COVID-19? 
Well, I think there's, what we found is there's a, a real need for nursing in occupational health. I think we found uh, in trying to manage occupational health just at the, the UCLA campus level, it is a tremendous undertaking and there is a level of education and availability that a nurse can provide that's different than another person uh, with a different qualification at something like a call center. Um, We've done a lot of work with also introducing nurses back into the primary care settings. So I think that as things evolve and people become more aware of what nurses do and uh, how they make a difference beyond doing a task, uh, people will find places for them in the ambulatory environment. Uh, another group that's growing that will grow exponentially when the governor signs the other bill on his desk uh, would be the role of the nurse practitioner in our community health. Uh, community health, especially with our attention to details around homelessness and some of the other um, populations we can't reach through trad traditional healthcare, um, there is gonna be a role in the community for nursing. Yeah, there always has been. I think that it's, it's played up and down depending on your community and what the needs are. School nursing is gonna come up again as well. Uh, I think we would be foolhardy to think that we're gonna be able to manage something like the COVID-19 virus, um, especially over the next couple of years without some level of nursing support in our school system, um, you know, more adequate than it is today. So those are, those are three areas where I see, and then of course, um, psychiatric care is big and I think it will continue to grow. And it's not that we haven't always had nurses in those fields, but it's that the role is much more critical today and has higher visibility by the public as to what they can do in those roles. So I see that as um, pretty impressive. Non-clinically related, I see people playing more of a role in um, information systems and technology, um, how, we, how we manage our data and really capture a whole person in a, in a one and two dimensional system that we call our electronic medical record is another place I see an opportunity. And research. Yes, and Karen, I, I wanna dovetail with some of the things you said. Uh, the School of Nursing in collaboration with the Fielding School of Public Health has had an occupational health nurse practitioner program for decades, I think. And it is a wonderful area for advanced practice nursing. I also want to give a shout out to the doctor of nursing practice because this is about implementation science. Some of the people who can handle big data and do problem solving. Clearly, COVID has created a whole new group of questions that our PhD scholars can uh, address. And the other area that we have partnered with over the years is in the community. We know that COVID in particular has hit our underserved communities. And we've had uh, partnerships um, uh, in the past in a variety of different settings. And this is an excellent experience for our nursing students. And I, I hope some reformulation about how we deliver nursing care um, perhaps door to door with public health nursing, getting uh, the honors and the kudos that it deserves. Green. Wonderful, thank you. Before I ask this next question, I just wanna gently remind anybody in the audience in case you do have any questions, feel free to go ahead and submit those in the Q&A box. Uh, all right, here's another audience question for Dr. Sarna. What plans are in place to have more black, indigenous, and people of color tenure track faculty? Thanks for asking that, Jonathan. And actually, I have to give a shout out to uh, Chancellor Block. By the way, I didn't begin by mentioning that UCLA has once again, for the fourth year in a row, been rated as the number one public research university in the nation. Uh, in response uh, to the incredible uh, heartbreak and racial disparities, Chancellor Block put forward an initiative uh, for 10 tenure track uh, uh, positions for faculty who are addressing the black experience, who mentor black faculty, who reach out to the community. 
uh, they've been they've tossed it out now to the deans and a key component of this is collaboration among the schools so several weeks ago uh, in the health sciences we definitely wanted some of these positions because we wanted the black experience in health to be emphasized so i look for applying uh, having an application uh, in, in uh, perhaps a joint FTE with the Fielding School of Public Health, with medicine, perhaps also to help our National Clinician Scholars Program that focus on, focuses on health inequities. I think it's a wonderful opportunity. The school needs to demonstrate its history, which we have had with our uh, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Council, our, our, our many activities, our sharing and caring and our partnership as well as funding for uh, success. So we're definitely going to try to compete for them. It is a competition. There are only 10 of them and we hope we're going to be successful. And by the way, I forgot to, to give another shout out to Karen because she mentioned on the governor's desk is that scope of practice bill. It's never gotten this far. We're all fingers crossed. And I hope he's going to have a virtual signing with nurses across the land. The University of California Schools of Nursing did a very strong letter of support for that bill. As did the health system. So, um, you know, he's, he's got a bunch of us knocking on his door. So I'm, I'm real hopeful that this gets done soon. We've got lots of work to do. Despite the CMA, right, Who, who's been coming after us. Yeah, they, anyway. <laughs> they're nervous, but there's plenty of work. I think that's the thing, right? There's so much work to do in the state of California that we don't have enough hands to take care of it all. This, is, this will be a wonderful opportunity to expand that. Great. Wonderful. Thank you. Next question is from the audience is going to be for Dr. Grimley. How has the quality of bedside and clinical nursing practice been affected due to the pandemic? It's, it's hard to say. I, that's kind of a, a lousy answer, but so many things, while many things changed around the nurse patient relationship, a lot of things grew stronger. A lot of nurses advocated for their patients, um, whether it was the right to a therapy or the right to um, take advantage of some of the old school care. Uh, one of the things about COVID is the treatment for COVID is not really state of the art for a fair percentage of the people who get COVID. It's about learning how to position yourselves and deep breathe and turn and things like that. Things that nurses have always done as part of their regular routine with any patient in the hospital. Um, so watching the nurses pull out all those things they did in the past and seeing them in action, um, having patients in an intensive care unit who didn't require being put on a, a breathing machine or a ventilator because they were getting the right level of care they needed um, was pretty impressive. Uh, nurses coming together, it takes approximately six people to prone or put a patient onto their belly, uh, depending on how big they are or how uh, weak they are from, from their, um, their illness. So watching nurses come together and partner like that was awe-inspiring. And I think that it touched them in a different way uh, as nurses. I think they realized that they, they understood their role in a much more meaningful way. They also learned to be good support for each other because they were all they had. Uh, they, there weren't a lot of people in the hospital, right? We stripped out all but the essential workers. So, and workers who needed to be in the area, we were learning how to zoom them in or have them phone in so that we didn't, we reduce the incidence of exposure for different groups. So they learned to, they learned to carry on. Uh, they also learned that they were pretty innovative. They put together some great things to do to, um, reduce the number of times they had to go into a COVID patient's room to just change a drip. They designed uh, ways to string the IV tubing to bring the, the um, 
IV pumps outside of the room. They could visualize the patient and somebody could be in the room, but at the same time, somebody could be working the pumps and changing out medications and things without having to use precious PPE. Um, we always had the right amount of supply for what we had to do, but it was because of the conscientious nature of the nurses and how they approached the care they delivered, which was pretty impressive. There were gonna be a lot of fatigued nurses from this. Um, I mean, that was the upside. It was also the camaraderie and the joy and the working together was at the beginning of the pandemic. Right now, if you're a marathon runner, you'll understand this very well, but we've always talked about the pandemic as a marathon. And right now we're at about mile 18. And that between 18 and 23 is where the hard work gets done. It's where you hit your wall. It's where you wait for endorphins to kick in. That's where nursing is today. And it's, it's um, some of the things that we're starting to see as well is, is some post-traumatic stress. This is a group that received accolades and um, recognition every single day for almost three months. And if you look today, there's very little on social media about nurses as superheroes or healthcare workers as superheroes anymore. There aren't any special treats coming in every day from um, you know, grateful donors. Uh, it, we're back to the work we always did, but we're still doing it in an environment that doesn't have an answer for COVID yet. So, so it will be different, I think, um, and not in a bad way. I'm very optimistic about what I've seen. Um, I'm always thrilled to see the resilience that, that most nurses have, but um, you can't take that lightly. So a lot of what we're teaching nurses now is to, is to expect support for mental well-being and to su expect support from us as leaders to provide that healthy work environment that goes beyond physically having what you need, but addresses uh, aspects of wellness and, and emotional support that we sometimes overlook because we're too busy taking care of the patients. So we, we're trying to teach each other to take care of ourselves. And um, so it, it's, it's been an honor to see this unfold, but it hasn't been without heartache. And Karen, I'd like to just add two two things. What you said was um, was so eloquent and spot on. I, I wanted to say that in the education space to get the students ready, one of our faculty, uh, daughter Dottie Wiley, got a uh, an independent course on pandemics ready for our uh, students to understand COVID nineteen within the context of all pandemics and the impact on the community health, public health, and nursing care. Uh, one of our faculty, Christian Choi, and our doctoral student, Anna Demerchin, did a call out to policymakers to have a nurse on the White House task force addressing COVID-19 to describe what nurses uh, could uh, bring to the table. So I think uh, that we are utilizing this devastating opportunity to challenge ourselves uh, to make nursing better but also to retool with schools uh, with new skills and of course that comes with the educator with remote learning yeah. when, our, when our faculty got the word that the stay at home word it was like finals week it's like guess what your finals are going to be held remotely and you can just imagine the screams, but they did it. They did it. They found a way to evaluate um, the students' um, uh, accomplishments remotely. And now they are getting better and better of looking at creative ways of delivering information, of engaging students in a virtual environment. And it's been hard and it's been challenging, but we're doing it. Thank you. Um, next question is for Dr. Sarna. Will we see more hybrid ed teaching of classes online as well as in-house? The person that uh, wrote this said they can't see the school going back just to in-house. Uh, I agree. Uh, I agree. And, and I think it provides more opportunities. It's interesting. Uh, another collaboration that Karen and I have 
is with the Hong Kong Hospital and Sanatorium, where we set up a virtual, thank goodness, virtual educational experience with our colleagues in Hong Kong, focused on leadership. And then there's going to be an in-person experience. We're hoping for spring, but we'll see. I think that uh, hybrid courses, which we've seen in our uh, DNP program, are also going to be um, uh, for the future. I do know that when I have a faculty meeting now, and I see over 100 people show up, I've never had 100 people show up in the past. So it provides other opportunities to get people uh, at, uh, and I, I don't even know where they are, they don't have to tell me wh where they are to participate in um, group processes and uh, virtual meetings, but I think it's going to challenge and change education. It's interesting, as part of our self-study review for CCNE, what we needed to do was to describe how we had adapted our education. And it's really going to be a record for the future, all the many, many things that we had to do to change when in-person learning was not possible. We'll see what happens when they have the next review. And, and I, think, I think one of the things we learned is that it works. <laughs> I think a lot of us, you know, uh, the, the people that we've put work from home that we always considered essentially had to be on site are doing great. And I think the students are getting a lot out of some of their learning as well. Um, but I do agree too, participation has never been uh, more than it has been on some of these group meetings because people can make the time to sit down and make a call, whereas before they had to get somewhere. So mm -hmm. it, it really has changed uh, changed our access to people and their opinions and knowledge. It, it certainly has had its challenges. Those of you who are educating young children at home, I know my daughter has three children on Zoom classes and to have enough Wi-Fi and enough computers and screens available. Uh, I know that my uh, grandson was rated as tardy because he was one minute late to his math class because he couldn't get on Zoom <laughs> in time. It, it, it's tough. And for some of our staff who also had to go remote and didn't have really a space to put a computer or a, or a chair, um, there have been challenges. So we're, we're still dealing with it. Fortunately, uh, UCLA has been reaching out uh, uh, to help with uh, some of those resources and a lot of educational program, programming as we're also having in the school about having creative learning in a remote environment. Thank you. This next question is for Dr. Grimley. Can you please discuss the relationship between the school and the hospital with respect to research collaboration and academic work? Need a lot of time for this one, Linda. <laughs> well, we've given a lot of examples. <laughs> yeah, we do. We have quite a few examples. I think um, we've done things at a variety of different levels. We've done it at the clinical level for the pre-licensure students. Um, I think Linda and I have really challenged ourselves and our teams to find as many ways as possible for us to intentionally partner uh, to show people the benefit of, of a strong academic clinical relationship. Um, I mentioned the dedicated education unit before. Um, that's such a great opportunity for a student to get a well-rounded understanding of where they're working, not only for the patients they're caring for, but for the environment they're working in. And while that's a great opportunity for the student, what it also did for us on the hospital side was it allowed that nurse who was managing those students on that, you know, on that unit to actually serve as their instructor and mentor, which in turn allowed them to start to get a taste of education, get a taste of being a clinical instructor. And it also gave the clinical instructors a little breathing room so that they could manage um, clinical practice, you know, the clinical uh, rotation differently. So it had benefits to more than just the students' experience that I think all of them uh, realized and appreciated. Um, other things we've partnered, we've had our, um, the Resnick Psychiatric Hospital 
has had uh, members of the faculty partner with the uh, with the nursing units on several projects that have actually won international acclaim. We have a, a healing garden that we put to, was put together by the staff um, at Resnick that. Um, yielded benefits to the patients in such a way that they, when they published the data, they were uh, invited to present at an international psychiatric nursing uh, conference in Switzerland. Um, we've had opportunities, we've had, a, I think it's 19 years now, we've had an evidence-based evidence research, uh, practice and research symposium here on site uh, that Linda and I now partner and share so that we're collectively engaging both the School of Nursing and the health system in promoting that. And that's an internationally recognized uh, event also. Uh, we usually get approximately 250 people who come, poster presentations, podium presentations, wonderful speakers from all over the country and world uh, who come to present and um, inform. But then they also come and learn about who we are. And we're very different is what we're finding compared to other academic uh, schools of nursing uh, who have medical centers and, and health systems uh, in their repertoire. So I think it, it's, it's pretty neat. Um, we have a host of doctorally prepared nurse leaders who have helped uh, by serving as uh, adjunct professors to the DN new DMP program. I myself uh, partner with one of the uh, professors, Dr. Carden, and we teach the finance course for the DMP program. Uh, we have several who do things on nursing leadership and um, other uh, coursework uh, you know, under Dr. Bush's guidance. So it's, it's been a wonderful opportunity for the health system to learn more about how to be academic and how to be educators. And it's been an opportunity for us to invite the faculty to learn more about us from a clinical perspective. Linda and I still have a little bit more work to do, so you can't go yet, um, because we have to do a better job of getting the faculty incorporated into what we do on the, on the medical center side, on the clinical side. Um, and that's just a matter of moving some things around um, before we can get that finally approved in a way that works for everyone. But, we're dying to get the faculty over to help us uh, because they are subject matter experts and things that um, are extremely pertinent to the care we provide um, across the health system. So, Linda, I'm sure you have a dozen things to add. Well, I, I'm just going to add one thing. I am really happy that Karen is on the search committee for the next dean for the School <laughs> of Nursing because I want Karen to be happy. Uh, I, I, I want that this partnership to continue, and I, it's so important. I have to say, when I began, um, uh, uh, it, it's grown a lot, and uh, this was before Karen came. Uh, Karen's uh, really had a transformative uh, impact, um, and um, but I'm happy that she is uh, part of the search committee. So I'll just say that. I know we're getting towards the end, aren't we? Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah, it's 629. So I'll ask just this last question. Um, I just wanted to say before I ask, thank you to everyone for all your questions. And if we weren't able to get to it, we'll make with uh, each of you who asked your questions individually after the event. Um, so this last question um, for Dr. Sarna, we've had several questions regarding how to help students and faculty during this time to help alleviate financial burden or to support COVID related research. It's a very good question and it is uh, one of the things that we're committed to in the School of Nursing. It's why this year, unlike any other year, uh, I provided an additional stipend for all of the graduate students. We developed a COVID uh, emergency support fund uh, to provide aid uh, to students. And uh, we also provided a stipend for our doctoral students, our PhD students, to be able to continue their work. We know that some students have had to make a decision to delay their education, and I'm really sorry about that. 
because of things that have happened in their family. Uh, but we're looking forward to do whatever we can to expand uh, financial support uh, for the students. Uh, my, my hope, frankly, is that the nation's gift to the nation's nurses would be free education for all nursing students. Uh, so we'll see whether that happens. Uh, but uh, I really think this is where we want to invest in the future. And especially as Karen mentioned, I'm a baby boomer. There are a whole lot of us who are going to be sense setting in, in the next decade. We are going to desperately need more nurses, especially more doctorally prepared nurses, both PhD and DNP nurses. So we're going to do our best to try to find resources to support that education. But before I end, I want to give a shout out to you, Jonathan. Thank you so much. You've done a great job. Thank you to Amy. Thank you to Michelle. Thank you to the UCLA development team for making this all possible, this crazy virtual town hall. But at least we got to all be together for this particular time. Thank you so much, Dean Sarna. And thank you to our speakers, Dr. Grimley, Dr. Sarna, for a wonderful town hall this evening. Um, as I mentioned before, if we were not able to get to your questions, we will follow up with you individually. Um, and in closing, I would just like to uh, mention some of the events that we have upcoming. So you should see now on your screen some of our upcoming events. Our next upcoming one is October 6th, COVID-19 and health equity stories from alumni on the front lines. Our virtual Brew and Nurse Networking Night is following that on October 20th. And then our virtual Distinguished Alumni Awards is on November 23rd. And then um, upcoming in the spring is the Pain and Palliative Care Lecture. Um, so uh, that's all we have for you this evening. Thank you so much to everybody for attending our first ever Dean's Town Hall. Um, there will be a post-event survey that should pop up after this. So please feel free to take that. It should only take 30 seconds of your time and would really help us program our future Zoom events. And with that, thank you to everyone and to all a good night. <laughs>